you ready for this? And welcome to the BCS Experience, History, Art, Culture, Politics, in Review and Discussion. I'm Byron C. Saunders, your host with the most. The BCS Experience takes a look at our rich history, African American history. We're going to share with you some known and unknown historical facts and information from the past and connect the dots on how they have impacted on our present-day events and how they will definitely shape our future as African Americans in this country and around the world. The BCS Experience, History, Arts, Culture, Politics, in Review and Discussion. This is Internet Radio and will be aired live every Wednesday from 5 to 6 p.m., from the studios of the Iron Metropolis Images on the GoPro Radio Network. You know, I'm really excited about this opportunity to talk to you all across the country and around the globe. I want you to tune in every week on your computer or your phone, and I want you to become a loyal listener. And I personally invite you to lend your voices to this radio talk show to express your opinions on my weekly topics. This is Social Network Radio at its finest. Now, here's the number for you to call in to be a part of the discussion. Call 347-884-9839. Once again, that number to call is 347-884-9839. Okay, this week's topic. History, history, history. A celebration of known and unknown heroes and sheroes that need to be recognized for their amazing contributions to the rich cultural legacy of African Americans and the African diaspora. My show is the new Underground Railroad Express. Uh, Next stop is your neighborhood. All aboard! to freedom and to freedom land. But before we get into the history, 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 we're going to start off with some history, history, history. We're going to connect all the dots today, folks. So much of our history has been hidden, but this is where we expose it and share with you the knowledge from a global perspective. All right, the date. It's a Wednesday. It's November the 17th, 1723. You see, on this date in 1723, we celebrate the birth of Crispus Attucks. Now, he was a black merchant and patriot. Little is known about the early years of Attucks. Now, he was born a slave around in uh, then colony of Massachusetts. His father, Prince Younger, was African, and his mother, Nancy Attucks, was an Indian and possible descendant of John Attucks, a member of the Natick Indian tribe. John Attucks was executed for treason in 1676 during the king's, the word Attuck in the Natick language means deer. In 1750, young Attucks, a slave of William Brown of Farmingham, was a successful horse and cattle trader who did business with the white men. He used the money he made to try to buy his freedom from his owner, William Brown, who refused his offer. Attox ran away. He was never caught, and nothing was known of him for nearly 20 years before he resurfaced again. Historians guess that he escaped to Nantucket, Massachusetts, and sailed as a harpooner on a whaling ship. Well, during those years, the American colonies resented having to buy almost everything from England and were unhappy about the lack of free trade. The most outspoken protests 
came from Massachusetts Colony. The British king, George III, sent two, two regiments into the Boston Harbor in the fall of 1769. Many conflicts with the citizens of Boston resulted, and one drew in Attucks, who was living in Boston on March 5th, 1770. Attox was eating dinner when he became aware of a fight between Boston men and British soldiers. He went to Dock Square to investigate. It has been said that he picked up a stick and shouted to the crowd gathered there to follow him to King Street, where they arrived. When they arrived, Attox went to the front of the crowd and struck at one of the British soldiers. The soldier fatally shot him twice. Four other men were killed and six more wounded. The next day, Attucks' body was taken to Faneuil Hall, and two days later, all the businesses were closed for his and the other victims' funeral. This event is known as the Boston Massacre. In 1888, a Christmas Attucks monument was erected on Boston Common, and in 1996, President Clinton enacted a Black Patriots Coin Law to commemorate African American contributions to the founding of America. The coin was struck in 1998, the 275th anniversary of the birth of Crispus Attucks, the first man to die for America's freedom. Never forget that, people. The first man, an African, to die for America's freedom in the war against the British. See, that's where our history starts, right there at the very beginning. All right. All right. Hey, hey, listen, I want to hear from you. Let's connect some of these dots and make sense out of it all. Let's call. Talk to me. 347 884-9839. All right, tonight I have a very special guest that's joining us. Joining us in the GoPro studio is my very dear friend, you, my listening audience. You see, with another opportunity to appreciate our rich cultural history and learn how it impacts on our lives today. I got a caller on the line already. Let's see who's on the line. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the BCS Experience. Who are you? Hi, this is Linda. How are you? Linda, how are things down there in Washington, D.C.? Awesome. Awesome. Are you ready for Thanksgiving? Yes, I am. Well, good. You're cooking? Yes, I am. Well, good. So it's going to be another historic moment at the Linda House. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> All right, now, now, Linda. Did you know all this about Christmas Attucks? Did you learn any of that in school? No. See? And I bet your kids who are, and your grandkids, probably did not know this piece of history. So you make sure you share with them about the first man who died for America's independence. A black man, Crispus Attucks. Okay, Linda, I got more history. We're going to talk to you today. Stay on the line. And let's see if we can connect some of these dots for you. All right. I got history, 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 people. Here's the next piece. The date is Thursday. It's November the 18th. It's 1813. You see, on this date, the birth of Samuel Burris in 1830 is remembered, and he was a black abolitionist and member of the Underground Railroad. All right. Samuel D. Burris was born in Willow Grove, Delaware a free black man in a time when slavery was at its peak. Burris and his family moved to Philadelphia, where he made trips back and forth to the South to free other blacks from slavery. With an abolitionist partner, John Hunn, they began working with the Underground Railroad System in 1845. They helped free slaves that were escaping from Delaware and Maryland. Burris was well aware of what he was doing and the consequences that would apply to him if he were ever caught. In the state of Delaware, if caught fending freeing slaves, the mandatory punishment was that one would be sold into slavery for a period of seven years. In June 1847, Burris was caught 
helping a woman by the name of Marie Matthews escape from Dover 100. Burris was put in Dover jail for 14 months while he awaited his trial. He was then convicted on November the 2nd, 1847, and sentenced into slavery through auction. When his friends and allies found he was about to be sold, one of them, Isaac Flint, posed as a slave buyer and bought Burris, then set him free. After the rescue, they left Delaware with no intentions to ever return again. Burris died in San Francisco, California on December the 3rd, 1863. 168 years later, on November the 2nd, 2015, Samuel Burris was pardoned posthumously. Wow. Just recently, several of Mr. Burris' descendants attending the ceremony, one of them, Osea Thomas, read from a letter Samuel Burris had sent his brother from prison in 1848. He said, you will recollect that the slave trader is only doing a lawful business, encouraged and protected by the laws of the state of Delaware, he wrote. Yet, I cannot forbear taking all opportunities to express great abhorrence of servitude and my passion for liberty upon any terms whatsoever. Governor Jack Markell of Delaware posthumously pardoned the man he called a hero. He was not content simply to secure his own freedom. Mr. Markell said at a ceremony Monday inside the old state house in Dover, the same building where Mr. Burris was convicted. He risked his life to ensure others would be free as well. The pardon called his conviction a historic wrong that cannot be corrected by a single stroke of a pen. But it recognizes Samuel Burris' acts, not as criminal acts, but as acts of freedom and bravery in the face of justice. Wow. Linda, had you ever heard of this story before? Uh, no. What, well, see, there you have it. And and what is the call name for the state of Delaware? I do believe it's called the Free State, isn't it, right? Free State. The Free State. Wow, Delaware. Yeah. Got a lot to, I'm telling you people, you see, this is why this history is important, Linda. Being able to share it with our kids, our grandkids, keeping the story alive. He didn't get a pardon until November the 2nd, 2015, 168 years later. Wow. That makes you think about some things that make you say, hmm, in America. That's right, folks. Still pardoning slaves who were wrongly convicted for trying to be free. But this man... William Burris, Samuel Burris, rather, Samuel D. Burris, member of the Underground Railroad, brought people to freedom, finally got his pardon November the 2nd, 2015. All right. Got some more history for you, Linda. Check this one out. Here we go. It's the date is Tuesday. It's November the 15th, and the year is 1825. You see, on this date in 1825, Sarah Jane Early was born. She was a black teacher, abolitionist, and feminist. Sarah Jane Woodson Early was born in Chillicothe, Ohio, the daughter of Thomas and Jemima Woodson. Much of her feminist and black community involvement took place through the African Methodist Church, We call that AME today, folks, and a number of black educational institutions. You see, in 1856, she earned an LB degree from Oberlin College, becoming one of the first black women to receive a college degree. From 1859 to 1860, while working at Wilberforce University, Early became the first black woman college faculty member. Hmm. She taught in a number of Ohio's black community schools and from 1860 to 1861 was a principal of the schools in Xenia, Ohio. In 1868, Early went to teach at a school for black girls in Hillsboro, North Carolina, run by the Freedmen's Bureau. 
That same year, she married Reverend Jordan W. Early, a pioneer in the AME church movement. She assisted in his ministry while teaching throughout the South, and in 1894, she chronicled her husband's work in the book, The Life and Labors of Reverend J.W. Early. Preaching and practicing her belief in the role of black women in racial uplift, Early was appointed superintendent of the colored division of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in 1888. Sarah Early died in 18, in August 1907. Okay, we're going to take a little break here. But when we come back, we've got more history, history, history right here on the GoPro Radio Network. So don't go away. Then we'll be right back to these very important messages. You're listening to content developed by the GoPro Radio Network, the fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network. Listen to the voices in your head. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a great opportunity. If you have an event, product, service, talent, or something important to say, now is your chance. You can have your very own radio show. Whether you're just starting out or a veteran looking for a professional platform to enhance your presentation and following, the GoPro Radio Network is the premier place to cultivate and share new and exciting content. We can help you grow your audience and keep it growing long after your first broadcast. Now you have a voice. Call 212-696-8562 or visit www.goproradio.com and you'll be amazed at how easy and affordable it is to have your very own professional radio show on the fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network, listening to the voices in your head. You're listening to content developed by the GoPro Radio Network, the fastest growing network in the galaxy. GoPro Radio Network, listen to the voices in your head. Right, already, I'm back. I'm BCS. Are you ready Byron C. Saunders, your host with the most. And this is the BCS experience on the GoPro Radio Network. Now, I, listeners, I got to tell you, newsflash, newsflash. Guess what? It's November, December 2015. So it's harvest time and it's holiday seasons are upon us. But you know something? I need your ongoing support. You see, my show, The BCS Experience, History, Arts, Culture, Politics, and Review and Discussion, is the longest-running show on the fastest-growing network. That's right, right here at GoPro Radio, the fastest-growing network in the galaxy. But I need your support to be able to stay on the air so that I can keep giving you this wonderful history. So being that it's holiday time, I need a gift a gift of at least $5 to help support this show to keep staying on the GoPro Radio Network. It's real easy, folks. You can be a part of the history as well. And I'm more than happy to share your name as part of the history as a sponsor and supporter of GoPro Radio. We're listener sponsored. What does that mean? You go to www.goproradio.com and click on Donation. In that box, you're going to show some love. Make a donation, at least $5, $10, $15 will get you a a gift, a signed autographed copy of this brand new book by Reverend Dr. D.L.C. Boyce, whose show Let's Talk You is featured on the BCS Experience once a month. She's soon to have her own show. Uh, called Let's Talk You. But folks, I need your love and support. So click that donation button, make your donation at least $5. Give the gift of live music. Help to keep black radio on the air. All right? And when you go to make close out, after making that donation, hit the button that says to identify where the donation is to go. And so say, I support the BCS experience. Okay, thank you for showing me the love so that I can continue to show you the love. All right, we're back. Folks, it's history, history, history. Linda, Linda, you still yes. on the air? Good. I you am got here. 
You want more history? I got history for you. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's rock and roll, people. All right. Here we go. The date. It's November the 17th. The year is 1834. You see, on this date, we celebrate the birth of Nancy Green in 1834. Now, she was a black storyteller and one of the first black corporate models in the United States. I bet you didn't know that, folks. You see, the world knew her as Aunt Jemima. That's right. But her given name was Nancy Green. The famous Aunt Jemima recipe was not her recipe, but she became the advertising world's first living trademark. Miss Green was born a slave in Montgomery County, Kentucky. Chris Rutt, a newspaper man, and Charles Underwood bought the Pearl Milling Company and had the original idea of developing and packaging a ready-mixed, self-rising pancake flour. To survive in a highly competitive business, the men needed an image for their product. Well, in 1889, Rutt attended a vaudeville show where he heard a catchy tune called Aunt Jemima, sung by a black-faced performer who was wearing an apron and bandana headband. He decided to call their pancake flour Aunt Jemima. Hmm. Rutt and Underwood were broke. So in 1890, they sold the formula to the R.T. Davis Milling Company. Mr. Davis began looking for a black woman to employ as a living trademark for his product, and he found Nancy Green in Chicago. She was 56 years old. The Aunt Jemima pancake mix was introduced in St. Joseph, Missouri. In 1893, the Davis Milling Company aggressively began an all-out promotion of Aunt Jemima at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Green, as Aunt Jemima, demonstrated the pancake mix and served thousands of pancakes. Green was a hit, friendly, a good storyteller, and a good cook. Her warm and appealing personality made her the ideal Aunt Jemima, a living trademark. Her exhibition booth drew so many people that special policemen were assigned to keep the crowds moving. The Davis Milling Company received over 50,000 orders and fair officials awarded Nancy Green a medal and certificate for her showmanship. She was proclaimed Pancake Queen. She was signed to a lifetime contract and traveled on promotional tours all over the country. Flower sales were up all year, and pancakes were no longer considered exclusively for breakfast. Nancy Green maintained this job until her car crash in Chicago killed her on September the 23rd, 1923. The Davis Company also ran into money problems and the Quaker Oats Company purchased the Aunt Jemima Mills in 1925. Wow. Now, I know y'all didn't know that story. Y'all was just buying Aunt Jemima syrup and Aunt Jemima pancakes and just didn't even know that who Aunt Jemima really was, but none other than Nancy Green. Venda, how many Aunt Jemima pancakes have you eaten in your life? Every day, that's my that's all I buy. <laughs> did you Angie know? Mama pancake uh, and Angie Mama sir. There you go. Now, did you know her? The name of the woman who was originally Aunt Jemima. Did you know that, Linda? Mm-hmm. No. Okay. Well, see, now you got some more history to tell your kids and grandkids at breakfast time, so that they understand and know that Aunt Jemima you know, was a real person, okay, modeled after Nancy Green. Oh, my goodness. Nancy Green, Aunt Jemima. I bet my folks back there in the the, uh, sound booth didn't even know that. I bet my producer didn't even know that. Did you know that, Mr. Producer? Had no idea, he said. How long you been eating that uh, pancakes for Aunt Jemima? All your life. See there, folks? We got history. We're connecting the dots. That's what this show is all about, the GoPro Radio. 
BCS experience. Connecting the dots for you. So the next time you have that breakfast, don't go to Pancake House. Go get you that box of Aunt Jemima and realize you you supporting Nancy Green. All right, historical moment. Here we go. More history. I got it right here. The date is Tuesday, November the 15th, and the year is 1898. You see, on this date in 1898, Lydia O. Newman, an African-American of New York City, acquired a patent for the hairbrush. Oh, my sisters, I know y'all need to know this. Newman's invention permitted easy cleaning by having a detachable unit which carried the brush and bristles. The patent number was 614335. Wow. Wow. Can we get a wow? That's an OMG moment, I'm telling you. All right, Lydia O. Newman. Did you know that, Linda? No. no. Did, I knew you knew a sister had to patent the brush. Come on now. Combing through our thick hair. No white, no white person could patent that. I'm sorry. Okay. It's just not, it ain't, it ain't happening. And so we owe this woman, as, and we owe it to the, the people who came after her, Madam C.J. Walker. I Madam got a young C. lady. She, that's right. Use the brush that this woman, Lydia O. Newman, got the patent for. My goodness. All you sisters out there making your hair so beautiful, you owe your debt of gratitude to the sister who created and patented the brush. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that one either. Okay. I got to tell you. You don't ever hear about that. No, you never hear about this one, Linda. Okay. But I got a sister who's coming up, hopefully be a sponsor of mine in the future, uh, Nana Doc, Dark Products, that uh, she's like the new, she's like the new Madam C.J. Walker in right here in 2015. Anyway, right. we'll talk about that later. I got more history, people. You want to talk to me? Call me up so we can talk history. 347-884-9839. Once again, that number to dial is 347-884-9839. Let's see if I can get this in before the next break. All right, here we go. It's a Saturday. It's November the 16th. It's the year 1901. You see, Jesse Stone was born on this date in 1901. He was an African-American band leader, songwriter, and music producer. Born in Atchison, Kansas, Stone was the grandson of Tennessee Slave. He began performing when he was five years old in his family's touring minstrel show. Well, during the 1920s, Stone was the leader of a jazz band that included saxophonist Coleman Hawkins. Around 1936, Duke Ellington helped Stone get work at New York City's Cotton Club. Well, during this time, Stone became a staff arranger, composer, and comedy writer at the Apollo Theater. Stone's musical career included working folk concerts, dance, R&B, and rock and roll bands. Well, he joined the staff of Atlantic Records as a producer, songwriter, and arranger in the late 1940s. Well, during that decade, Stone wrote Idaho, which was played by Guy Lombardo and sold three million copies. Stone understood the racism in the industry and knew that only the talent of black Americans in music would break the color barrier with white artists playing black music. Stone, Herb Abrams, his partner, and the Cleveland DJ Alan Freed made a trip throughout the South, eventually finding Bill Haley and the Comets. It was Stone who made the decision that this band was the one to do it. He went on to record Haley performing his song, Shake, Rattle, and Roll, on Decca Records. The single sold a million copies, peaking at number seven, pop on Billboard's charts during the summer of 1954, and assisting in the acceptance of Negro music by white audiences. It was included on the album Rock Around the Clock, which hit number 12, pop in early 1956, and boasted the million-selling title track that held the number one pop spot 
for eight weeks to number three R&B in spring 1955 in the 1954 Glenn Ford movie, Black Ford Jungle. I'm going to stop right there because when we come back, I'm going to tell you some more history. Oh, you're going to love this about this person. So don't go away. You're listening to the BCS Experience on the GoPro Radio Network. I'll be right back right after these words. 